Good morning and welcome. I think we've got about a dozen people uh, in the webinar as well. My name's Craig Connolly. I'm the CEO of the Potter Foundation. Um, we haven't done this presentation before. For my sins, I'm a former um, equity analyst with uh, J.B. Weir and Goldman Sachs and I'm a chartered accountant, so I know a bit about financials. And we thought we'd just sort of walk you through what we look for in budgeting and financials. I will make the point that I don't look at your budgets or financials. I don't review applications. That's the job of the program managers. And so um, what I'm going to do is walk you through sort of what we look for and, and what you should be expecting. We are relatively sophisticated with our review of your, the financial components of your applications. Um, and you should seek to be sophisticated in terms of what you supply us. Um, one of the things that I've increasingly focused on with the team is for us as a foundation to undertake what I refer to as organisational due diligence. Um, so you need to be, you know, part of an organisation that we as a foundation, you know, should really think about supporting. Um, and that doesn't just include your ability to fulfil your mission by uh, addressing the particular cohort you're looking to address in the area of interest to you, which should also be your capacity to actually sustain your operations um, and carry out the mission that it is that you're looking uh, to achieve funding for. Um, so we look at your cash flow statements, we look at the balance sheet, we look at reserves. Um, it's an interesting question, what level of reserves is appropriate? We initially had two months of working capital. Alberto, who's the senior program manager, his view was three months of working capital. Um, my view is it should probably be at least six months of working capital. Um, it depends on the size of the organisation. Um, we do get applications from a lot of smaller organisations and a lot of smaller organisations who are really operating on the smell of an oily rag. Um, we do get that. So whilst I've got a guide up there of three months of working capital, you know, we will treat applications on a case by case basis. We will genuinely tell applicants you're not ready for funding from us. And that's happened in the current round of applications where one applicant will learn after the board meeting that we don't think they're ready for our funding. We don't think they're developed enough as an organisation. We like what they're proposing. Come back to us in 12 months when you've actually done a few things and we'll have suggestions for them in that regard. So we do take this quite seriously. Uh, we do talk about it a lot as a team and we think about it uh, quite deeply. Um, but now the point I'd make is that last point is we do understand we are servicing the not-for-profit sector. Um, we are servicing a lot of universities. We're servicing a lot of larger not-for-profits and smaller not-for-profits. Um, we do see a lot, we do treat, as I said, all applications on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, but to the extent that you can really demonstrate your financial readiness to achieve funding through you know, really good quality and sophisticated uh, financial statements and cash flow statements, you should do that to the best you can. We also talk to other funders. Uh, we ask you to advise us um, who your other funding partners have been. Um, you know, track record of operating effectively and being supported by other funders carries a lot of weight with program managers, carries a lot of weight with board members as well. So to the extent that you have a track record of operating effectively um, with funding support from other philanthropic funders, with funding support from local councils, from state government, from Commonwealth government, that all goes to establishing uh, your credibility as an organisation that is able to deliver um, over time on whatever it is that you are doing. Um, it's far better if your organisation has a diverse source of income to the extent that's possible. And there was a situation where prior to my joining, um, a recipient of uh, a grant from the Potter Foundation based in Tasmania um, lost a, uh, a major uh, government contract uh, and the loss of that government contract basically rendered the whole operation um, void. Um, and so a lot of our funds you know, went down the drain um, and we didn't do enough due diligence, in my opinion, as a foundation on the sustainability of that particular organisation. Um, and, you know, you will never, you, we will always have um, organisations that we support um, who for a variety of reasons are not able to uh, achieve the mission, are not, are not able to finish the project, um, are not able to continue as an entity or an organisation. That happens from time to time. Um, so we will never um, be in a position where that does not happen, but we will try and minimise uh, the, the, the times that that does occur for organisations that we support. Um, and that's the last point. If there is a single reliance on one contract for financial sustainability, that's a major issue. It's a major issue for the organisation, whether or not they're applying to us as a funder. And as a relatively short-term philanthropic funding source, we are not a viable alternative or secondary source of income. We must be a part of a broader strategy. And so it gets back to 
again, your organisation, um, how sophisticated you are in terms of thinking about your strategic viability. Um, what are your funding sources? Um, how are you accessing those? Uh, do you have enough working capital to employ a professional fundraiser? Um, is that professional fundraiser implementing a, a sophisticated strategy to diversify your income stream? Um, if you're not in a position to ask a lot of those questions, maybe you're not ready to apply to a foundation like Potter or others, um, or maybe you need to be up front and, and highlight that funding from the Potter Foundation might actually allow you to employ those people to achieve that sustainability as well. That gets back to you guys understanding where you're at in your own development as an organisation. Um, we do also, uh, I think it's fair to say we're probably one of the few foundations that uh, funds significant amount of capital towards capital projects. I'm not sure a lot of foundations do fund capital works. We do. Um, and as part of that, if you are applying to the foundation for significant capital works, one thing you must ensure is included is appropriate um, contingency planning for any CapEx projects. So we've contributed off the top of my head, um, $10 million towards the um, development or redevelopment of Queen's Hall, the State Library of Victoria, uh, $5 million towards the Chow Chuck Wing Museum at the University of Sydney. Um, there are a couple off the top of my head. Um, and I know being um, intimately involved with both of those applications that there is detailed contingency components to each of those CapEx budgets. Um, if there is a medical research uh, application, for example, and so we might be contributing $200,000 towards a half a million or a million dollar cost of um, a particular project. It might have been uh, the, uh, the WeHi $3 million um, genomics grant, for example. That was a major CapEx project um, down in Melbourne. Um, there will be a contingency component to that. Um, so again, that just reflects sophistication in the construct of the CapEx budget for an organisation putting that sort of project together. We don't fund 100% of any project. Um, I think the range would be anywhere from sort of 25 to maybe as high as 55%. It depends on the organisation, depends on the project. Um, I would say as a rough rule of thumb, maybe a third to 40% uh, would be the range. Um, interestingly, uh, this next example I have here, and I'll flick between slides now. But if you have a look at uh, this project budget, which is a, a sample volunteer program, you'll see the numbers here. At the top, the amount of income sought from the Potter Foundation is $300,000. The total project budget is $863,000. That includes $213,000 of in-kind contribution, which is effectively valuing uh, the time of volunteers uh, contributing to this project. If you back out the volunteer component of that, then the cash cost of the project is $650,000 and our contribution that's being sought is $300,000. So very rough rule of thumb, that's probably about 43, 44% of project cost or thereabouts. So I'd be pitching you know, Potter's contribution, somewhere between 25 to 50% if you're applying to Potter. Um, we are very proactive in seeking to support organisations and encouraging organisations to seek leverage from other partners. And I'm not fussed whether they're corporate partners, philanthropic partners, government, whether it's in-kind support, or whether it's contributions from the organisation itself. When you think about sources of revenue for any not-for-profit organisation, it's actually not rocket science. You know, a large chunk of funding comes from government, and that government source might be local, it might be state, it might be Commonwealth. Um, and it comes through various entities, but essentially they're your three main funding sources when you talk about government. Your other major partner is a corporate partner, um, and that corporate relationship will stem from community engagement with your organisation, um, and likely address a particular corporate social responsible need that that corporate's wanting to address, I would say. So aside from corporates and aside from government, you've got philanthropic or you've got your own corpus, um, or you've then got other contributors or donors. But outside of that, there's not many other sources of income for most not-for-profits. Um, and the rare social enterprise, thank you Alberta, and those, that comes under your self-funding, but some organisations um, do have the ability to generate a social enterprise of some sort, which generates some income to cover costs. I think the best that we've seen is probably street, would you say, which generates two thirds of its, it covers two thirds of its cost base through the, its own income that it generates. I'm not a believer in a social enterprise, sorry. I haven't seen yet a social enterprise that fully funds its operation. I'm not sure that it's possible. Um, jigsaw, okay, thank you, there's one. Um, and that's a one out of how many that we cover, Alberto? Okay, so one in 45 is self-funding. Um, if you have that ability, I think an important lesson or learning from this brief presentation is that Potter 
is actually very engaged, particularly through Alberto, very engaged in trying to assist organisations to develop social enterprise models. Um, and it's something that we do embrace. Um, we do take a detailed look at each line item um, in both your income and expenditure side of the budget. So I'm gonna walk through this with you. Um, I asked Louise Arkles a question before, because as I said at the outset, I don't review budgets as part of the review applications. That's what the team does. Um, I have been involved with uh, Nicole, who's not here twice in the last three to four months in assessing financials of organisations. So where um, the program managers need that input from me, I'm happy to provide it. In both instances, I've actually said to Nicole, the organisation is not ready for our funding. So the financials very quickly highlighted, they just didn't have an asset base of any sort. Uh, they were applying to us too early. They were asking for too much funding. They needed to go away and think about strategically how else they could source other um, income streams. Um, and you know, we'll make that hard call. So we will go through a project budget, we will go through organisational finances as well. Um, as you can see here, as I mentioned earlier, 300,000 from Potter out of a cash component of about $650,000. Whether it's a, a small or a relatively um, more significant cash contribution from the applicant, I don't think it really matters. I think the fact that the applicant organisation is putting in some cash is important. I wouldn't say that there's a rule of thumb. I think it's what the organisation can afford to be honest. But to the extent that you know, that is significant to the organisation, this might have been significant to this particular organisation, that's important to, to note uh, because we understand then that you regard this as an important enough project for you to put your own capital towards. So 300 grand from Potter, 30,000 from the organisation, confirmed funding from one other foundation and applications to other um, sources of funding. We often um, issue uh, grants or approve grants at board subject to funding being raised as well. So in this situation, it may be that the Potter board assesses this particular opportunity and says, yes, we're happy uh, to uh, contribute $300,000 towards this. It might be 100 grand a year over three years. Uh, we might also say, look, we're concerned that, you know, given our funding is funding salaries and wages and office supplies and, and a whole host of things that we know are critical to this project, that we would want to ensure that the 145,000, which has been applied for, but is currently unconfirmed, is actually secured before we release our funding. That's what would be a subject to grant uh, from Potter. We would then very happily turn around and write a letter of support to that funder to indicate that our funding is confirmed, subject to them uh, coming on board. Uh, and that often carries a lot of weight um, as well. We certainly do that with government quite proactively. Um, that's the income side, it's relatively straightforward. Um, if you then look at the cost side, um, some foundations would look at this and they would say, we're not comfortable funding advertising and promotion. We don't think we should be funding office rent and training room hire. Some foundations would turn around and say, we think that is cost you should cover as, as an organization. What we want to fund is we want to fund the project implementation manager. So we'd like to put 238,000 direct towards that person. Um, I prefer that the Potter Foundation not work like that. Um, I, I just think ultimately, if we are backing a project and backing an organisation, then we back the organisation. And we understand the organisation has overall funding needs for the project and possibly overall funding needs just for their own requirements. And if that includes what you might regard as general operating costs, then so be it. Um, so we have had our board confirm to us as part of a, a process we went through uh, at our board planning day last year, that they as a board are more than comfortable, the Potter Foundation funding, what I describe as general operating uh, capacity or operating support for organisations. So we don't need to have our funding tied to a particular position. Um, we prefer organisations to be very upfront with us and basically explain to the program manager through the application process why these costs are so integral to this project being a viable project. If that's the case, then the money you're seeking from Potter at $300,000 will just go towards funding you know, the, the particular project requirements for this project itself. And I know there are other foundations who will literally turn around and say, I want to fund that person or I want to fund that particular piece of capex. It's not how we tend to operate. I think we used to operate that way, Alberta, is that fair? And that's certainly changed in the last three years. Um, there's not much else to it, to be frank. Um, the, the, one, the one message that I would um, emphasise to organisations applying for funding to Potter or any other foundation is Spend time first thinking about why it is you're seeking funding. Um, so a question I often put to 
uh, organisations, particularly universities, we get a lot of applications from organisations um, and larger organisations might have multiple projects they're looking for funding from us. And they might say, we've got three projects and we think two of them might fit with Potter, what do you think? And I like to turn that question back around to the organisation and say to the organisation, which of these projects is the most important to you as an organisation? And it might be you've only got one and that's fine. Um, if you have one project or multiple projects, you've got to convince the funder that we understand, sorry, we understand as a funder, that this project is of significant strategic importance to you as an organisation. And if that's the case that you've spent the time thinking about from a strategic perspective, how it is you can fund and then sustain that project as well. So it is a challenge. Um, and I, I do get that a lot of smaller organisations who don't have the staff or the time to think that way, you might struggle to do that, but I think it's actually really important. Um, we, or I, am asking the team to take a step back as part of the organisational due diligence that we do and really ask some tough questions. Does this organisation think strategically? Can they sustain themselves beyond the two, three, four year period of this project? Um, we will make a call as to whether we think the project is um, in the, fits with our funding guidelines, uh, is something that we think is of interest to us to fund, uh, given our funding priorities, and something we think the board would be interested in as well. Um, the last element that I would um, note is, as I said earlier, the guy sitting in front of me here and, and myself, we are a genuine um, management team and we don't have votes at board. So we spend a lot of time talking about how we can assist organisations to frame their applications to ensure they will then actually appeal to the governors. Uh, we have a board of 14. Uh, as I said before, Lady Potter is a life governor and 13 other external governors. Um, and they are eminent people. I think someone said, a squirrel said in her presentation, they're high court justices or S vice chancellors or you know, very smart, experienced people. Uh, when Alberto and I were in Alice Springs earlier this week with Lauren as well, we were also accompanied by um, Alex Chernov, who's one of our, our board members. So the board members do get out and undertake due diligence and do the work and, and ensure that they're connecting with the communities we're hoping to support as well. Um, you've got to make sure you have a case um, that really bears scrutiny by that sort of person uh, because the level of scrutiny that your applications then undergo through the application process and then at board level um, is significant. And because we're, such a, because we're such a large foundation in the context of Australian philanthropy, and because we're required to distribute nearly $30 million of funding a year, um, we see a lot of really exceptional projects as well. So you need to raise you know, this element of your application to a level where it is um, competitive with other uh, applications from organisations who are you know, really adept at including and supplying this sort of information. So I'm going to open up to questions. If anyone has any questions at all of any sort, feel free. And thank you for your time. Yes. Um, it can carry a huge amount of weight. So for those two organisations I mentioned previously where uh, Nicole and I chatted about their capacity to be ready for the grant, it was the, it was the one defining issue which meant we've gone back to them or we will go back to one and have gone back to the other and said not yet. You're not ready. Um, correct. Yes, it is. It's more. It, it gets more to sustainability and, and ability to deliver on the project. So um, there are a lot of well-intentioned people in the world, and there are a lot of well-intentioned people working in community that need significant support. Um, but the reality is, some of those people just don't have the capacity to really achieve what it is they hope to achieve at the moment. And so it becomes very important. Yeah. Yes. I wouldn't describe it as a limit. It's a guide. Um, I'd say going anywhere beyond 50%, I'm going to look to the front here, is very unusual. Very unusual. Yeah, it happens from time to time. So maybe as high as 55. 60 maybe. Um, we do genuinely treat each application on a case by case basis um, because they are each, each application is individually assessed by each of the program managers in the relevant program area. Um, you know, it'd be very unusual. It's not a limit, um, it's a guide. Uh, it'd be very unusual to be above 50%. That's right. I've got a question from one of the webinar. Right. It's around um, co-funding. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. um, how do we begin or initiate a two-way process on discussing co-funding? Is it only instigated on Ian Potter's side or can the applicant contact the program manager during the review process or provide updates? So if you go back to the um, detail I had on the screen where we had $300,000 application to Potter, 145,000 confirmed and 145,000 application in but unconfirmed. Um, that clearly is an application that the organisations put in. That might have been an application generated by the applicant or it might have been generated by Potter. So my view is that you have a conversation with the program manager at any point. Again, no hard and fast rule. I mean, my, I, I worked in investment banking uh, for 20 years. Um, I was basically a professional marketer for 10 of those. Um, and my view is very much we are here to work with those organisations that we hope to support to help you achieve your mission. We achieve our mission through the organisations we support. And so I'm very strong in the view that if that means I go to have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with you, with an organisation to assist you in raising funding, then that's what I would do. And I do that a lot um, as well. So I don't have a problem with that. And that can be a phone call, not to me directly initially, it'll be through the program manager, I would suggest. Um, but I tend to get involved um, from time to time. Um, and so that might be a call from the applicant. It might be uh, something that occurs or develops um, as the application is reviewed. Um, it just depends. Again, it's case by case basis. Hi. Um, you knocked out the in kind support line when you calculated the percentage for Ian Potter. Yeah, um, cash. Yeah, okay. So, what role does the in kind line play, if any? Uh, I think it highlights um, that one in particular was uh, volunteer hours. So from memory, it's 5,900 hours at 35 bucks an hour or something like that was the value. Um, it highlights from my perspective that you have significant support from the community, from volunteers. Um, and so that in-kind contribution in that instance demonstrates that you are connected into your community. Um, it might be also that you're part of a larger organisation where you're getting access to, you know, point two of a position um, or point five of a position or a number of positions where you're getting admin support or general operating support uh, from the larger organisation. And that's important to understand that you have access to that capacity, if you like. So it is important, um, but I'm then, and, and it might also be that um, in kind might be 30, 40% of the total cost. In that case, I probably wouldn't knock it out. Uh, I might keep it in there. So that's again, case by case. And I have, and I have seen situations where the in-kind and the cash from Potter are the two major components. What would you add, Louise? Yeah, depending on the situation, we, we, we sometimes do keep that in-kind in and take that so yeah. that it's still perhaps 35, 40% of the total budget, including in-kind, yeah, but it right. does depend on the project. It does, yep. Thanks. Any other questions? Yes. Do you ever negotiate down contributions? Um, do you want to repeat the question? Yeah, so the question was, do we ever negotiate down, an interesting term, I'll come back to that. Do we ever negotiate down the amount that's being sought or do we just literally look to fund what's um, being applied for? Is that fair? That's the question. Um, yeah, look, sometimes the program managers do have conversations with organisations. So I can think of one recently uh, where an organisation applied for 600,000 over three years and we said to them 300,000 over three years is probably all we can fund and, and took that sort of 300,000 baseline application into uh, through the application process. And so they then needed to find another 300,000, which is fine. Um, so we tend to have those conversations up front um, to ensure that your application reflects the amount of funding that Potter can fund. The one, or sorry, the amount of funding that Potter um, can consider funding. What we don't like doing anymore, and we did used to do this, was say you apply for 300,000 over three years and we say, look, it's a decent application, it's a good organisation, let's give them half what they ask for. Because that, you know, I think Squirrel's sitting up on the top right as I look at it here, that's a recipe for failure. Uh, part funding organisations um, means that you are putting that organisation under undue pressure. Um, so to the extent that we have those initial conversations with you, to negotiate or discuss what we can reasonably fund and what we think it's reasonable for us to fund. Uh, once that figure is agreed, that's the figure that goes through to board. Um, and we as a team, myself and the program managers through our committee meeting process, 
are now very strong at saying to the board, if they're asking for 300 grand and you like it, fund the 300,000. And we had an instance of that in a recent um, meeting, I can't remember which, it was science, yeah, thank you, um, where one of the board members said, it's great, they're asking for a couple hundred thousand, let's give them a hundred. And I just said, no, you either really like, it was more than that, but I said, no, you either really like the project or you don't, and if you do, let's fund it in full because we can afford to. And we funded it in full. Yeah, so that's, I hope that answers your question. Great. Okay, I oh, know one more question. Yep. Just in terms of um, applications, oh, sorry, it's Will Croft again. Do you often um, fund an evaluation component if that's seen as an important part of a project? Yes. Simple question is yes. Um, I have, uh, I have, th there is a small element in our overall budget which we now call impact enhancement grants. Um, and so we might use those impact enhancement grants, which can be up to $25,000 or thereabouts. Uh, to maybe fund evaluations to assist existing grantees. Um, but uh, we prefer to embed, if you like, appropriate evaluation costs into an overall grant application, yes. Sorry, Alberto. No, I'm glad I was smiling because it's 20,000, but we don't have 5,000. So it's all right. I just mentioned the impact enhancement grants of 25,000. Alberto said they're only 20. What? Alberto doesn't know as a finance committee meeting last week, we increased from 20 to 25. So. Yay. <laughs> so so I, 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 haven't, I haven't told my team that yet. Yeah. It's, it's really good news. <laughs> it, was actually on, it was actually on yours and Squirrel's recommendations. So that's why it, it happened. You can, Louise, please. Can you see we're a very involved team? It's great. <laughs> I just also uh, thought of the uh, that it's worth mentioning that as well as evaluation, it's also worth thinking about your comms. If you need comms strategies, if you've got other things to the side perhaps rather than central to your project but might be critical to its success, build those into the budget. So we want to hear about the true costs. Think about in a best case scenario, what would we need to do for this to really take off and achieve maximum impact? and build those costs into your budget. And sometimes within the discussions, we might turn around and say, actually, we feel that we couldn't fund that, we couldn't support that much administration, do you really need this? But at least start off with that by building it in, and um, then you've got a better chance of being able to achieve what you're trying to do. So I can think of one example, because that's a really great point. Louise and I, Back in October, November 2015, so it was after I'd first joined, this was uh, with David, um, and we met with a scientist at a university who I won't name, but they're now a, um, a, a grantee of ours, so they, they won funding from us. Um, and we went to meet this guy because he's a, he's a world-renowned scientist and it was in the environment space, and Louise and I sat down with him and he said, um, look, I've got this project, it's a two-year project, um, I need this amount of funding. And Louise and I stopped him and said, listen, David, we, we understand where you're coming from, but you know, two years, is that really enough time? Um, if you thought bigger picture, what could it be? What could it look like? And he turned around in the blink of an eye and said, right, it's a five year project. It's, it's five times the size. It needs comm support. It needs all sorts of things. And that's what we ended up funding. So it went from a, I think it was a three to $400,000 grant application to a $2 million grant um, over five years as part of a $10 million project. Um, and it's a five year project and it's got funding from the university and it's got funding from other sources. Um, and that was an example of Louise and I sitting with him and saying, what do you need for this project to succeed? Um, and so I think maybe we're a little bit different to other foundations in that the team do sit down and think about that. They understand that you have other needs and other requirements to make sure your project works. And that goes back to my earlier point that I made. You've got to take a step back and think strategically about your organisation and where you're placed and what you need uh, for your project or your organisation to, to succeed and to thrive. Uh, because if you think that way and you come to us with a more complete and fully rounded and well-considered application, it improves your chances of that application having some sort of success. We're going to need to wrap. That's great. Everyone, thanks for your time. Cheers.